Right, here we are. So I'm just going to pick up right where I left off. So I was describing the uh, concept of thermal energy also, by the way, uh, as I mentioned, called the uh, internal energy. of uh, my cup of coffee here. And I described that the internal energy, the thermal energy, is uh, an indicator and is caused by the average kinetic energy of all the particles that make up my system, in this case, my coffee. Uh, so then I, and then I ended with the question, OK, so what about the air uh, in my surroundings uh, interacting with the boundary uh, between uh, my system and my surroundings? And what can we say about that, and how does that affect it? <clears throat> well, the, uh, the answer is that uh, the same analysis about, uh, about um, uh, how warm the air is or how cold the air is as being uh, indicated and measured by the average kinetic energy of these air particles, of these air molecules, is also, uh, also holds here. That is to say, uh, the, uh, the, higher temp the, the, the hotter the air is, the higher the temperature of the air, the faster, on average, all these air molecules are moving, or more usefully, the higher kinetic energy each uh, air molecule has. As I said, 78% of these are nitrogen molecules, 21% of them are oxygen molecules, and then an admixture of other things, very different masses, very different kinetic energy, well, very different masses, uh, different velocities, uh, and uh, their kinetic energies are going to be changing continuously, so we talk about an average kinetic energy. So here's the idea. If the average kinetic energy uh, of the air molecules, the surroundings, that is, is different from the average kinetic energy of the coffee molecules, and we'll take the most usual case, if the coffee is hotter than the air, which it should be, uh, that means that the average kinetic energy of the air molecules is smaller than the average kinetic energy of the coffee molecules, right? Uh, but what does that mean? Well, the air molecules, likewise, just as I described uh, the, uh, the coffee molecules as being continuously in motion, so too the air molecules are continuously in motion, and that means that at the boundary, the air molecules are colliding with the boundary, transferring some of their energy into the boundary. But the same is true on the other side. The coffee molecules are colliding with the boundary, transferring some of their energy into the boundary from the other side, from the inside of the cup. Remember that in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in an inelastic collision, and, uh, Although momentum is always conserved, kinetic energy tends to be lost. Well, now we know where it went. The, the kinetic energy that, the, um, that the, part, the coffee molecules lose to the boundary gets transferred to the surroundings. And so the coffee gets cooler, meaning it loses energy, loses the average kinetic energy of its particles, whereas the air surrounding it, at least near it, uh, near the boundary, gains uh, that, uh, that kinetic energy because of particle-particle collisions. So the, the coffee loses energy to the surroundings. The coffee cools down. The surroundings heat up. And uh, eventually what happens is that the average kinetic energy of the coffee cup, part of the coffee molecules, and the average kinetic energy of the surrounding air molecules, those kinetic energies are the same. Once that happens, there's no longer a net flow of energy across the boundary. And so whatever, however hot you say, think the coffee is, however hot you think the air is, whatever temperature you think the coffee is at, whatever temperature the air is at, those are all going to become equal in the long term. You know this perfectly well. You leave even a cold glass of ice water out on the counter long enough, the ice will eventually melt, the water will eventually warm up, it will eventually become at the same temperature as the, uh, as the surrounding air is. And, uh, and if you leave your coffee cup sitting long enough, it eventually gets too cold to, to really enjoy drinking. And this is getting really close to that. And then you put it in the microwave, add energy to it, increase the average kinetic energy of these things. OK, so eventually, so, so that's, that's how the, the whole thing works. Now, the boundary uh, is and uh, I, I can be and often is chosen to um, uh, make this uh, energy transfer very difficult 
which has the effect of it takes a long time for this equilibrium state to be to become established. And so the more uh, the, the the better this boundary is at present at preventing the uh, flow of energy across it, the longer your coffee stays hot. Okay, and uh, what we're talking about here now is uh, a, co a coffee cup that's made of styrofoam, for example, because styrofoam uh, molecules don't uh, accept um, don't accept energy very easily. They're highly highly elastic. And so when the coffee cups collide with styrofoam molecules, there's not much of a transfer of energy. Okay? And, and so the coffee stays hotter longer. Okay? And a thermos um, works on a very different principle. We'll discuss that in later, uh, later lectures. But in any case, the bottom line here is that we've got a whole bunch of thermal energy here. We've got less thermal energy out here. The energy uh, flows from the higher, uh, higher uh, temperature object, the higher energy object, to the lower temperature surroundings. And so we have a flow of energy across this boundary. And the, the rate at which it, that heat can, the, the rate at which that energy flows across the boundary can be uh, large or small, depending on the physical nature of the boundary. These, these paper cups are OK, uh, but you know they're not wonderful. And you can tell just by looking at this, because what's this cardboard sleeve? The reason for the cardboard sleeve is that the just the, the raw hot coffee fresh out of the fresh out of the um, the uh, coffee pot is so hot you can't comfortably hold it in your hand. Your hand gets really hot. You get burned. So they, they put this second boundary here as an as a uh, second layer to slow down the rate of which uh, heat can flow from the hot coffee event across several boundaries eventually to your hand. So that's what that is all. Okay, that's cool. And it works in reverse, too, by the way. If you get an ice to drink, then the energy inside is going to be lower than the, the, the I'm sorry, I'm going to say that carefully. The, the internal energy is going to be lower than the internal energy of the surroundings, of the surrounding air. And so there'll be a net flow of energy in from the surroundings through the boundary into the cold coffee, the iced coffee. But it's the same principle. The, the energy flows from a region of high internal energy to a region of lower internal energy. And that's always the case. And if that sounds vaguely familiar, it sounds something like uh, changes of potential energy spontaneously moves from spontaneously high to spontaneously low. That similarity is very, very correct. Good. All right. I've been throwing around the words that I intend to define because I know that you are comfortable with them in a sort of a vague sense. The words I'm using, I've been using are um, heat and temperature, uh, hotter and colder. Now let's, uh, let's put some more specific definitions to all that. The I said a little while ago that the, uh, in, that the thermal energy or internal energy of my cup of coffee is uh, calculated from the average kinetic energy of the coffee particles uh, and water molecule particles and so on that are, uh, that are inside my cup. Uh, and I also said that we talk about an average because there's no possible way of calculating the individual kinetic energies um, at all. And what we do, uh, or what has been done, is we've defined a new physical quantity. And we say this new quantity, and now I'm going to call it temperature, give it the symbol capital T, it is, the temperature is going to be a property of your system. It is a property, by property I mean here, I mean property in the same sense that I meant property when I talk about mass or when I talk about electric charge or when I talk about density. It is a physical property that is part of, uh, part of what makes the object what it is, okay? Uh, so if I, if, if I have two identical cups of coffee, but one of them is a, has a very high temperature, the other one has a very low temperature, those two those two cups of coffee, even though they're identical otherwise, are quite different. Okay? 
So temperature is just a property that the thing has. And depending on, well, I don't want to say that. Uh, so uh, it's a property. And, and part of its definition, part of its definition is, is that it's directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles. Proportional The idea is this. Since it is absolutely impossible, even in principle, to, um, to enumerate the kinetic energies of each of the constituent particles, we don't even bother trying. We can calculate an expression for the average kinetic energy. That's not terribly difficult, and I'll show you, uh, uh, I'll show you that later. But uh, so we essentially change our point of view from asking about the average kinetic energy of the particles or even the individual kinetic energy of the particles. We'll define this new property. We call the temperature, it's, as I said, property of the system, and we will say that it is a value, a number with units, uh, that uh, whose value is directly proportional to how much, uh, how much uh, internal energy the system has, which is equivalent to saying, um, the temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the constituent particles. And by the way, this is a particle average, not a time average or a space average. We're averaging over, you take all, if in principle, the average kinetic energy would be, you'd, you'd find the average of, the average kinetic energy of each particle, add those all together and then divide that number by the total number of particles that you have. That would be, that's the kinetic, average kinetic energy that I'm talking about. Again, there's no way we can do that. So we uh, define temperature as a substitute, as a stand-in, as a proxy for that idea. So in short, the, uh, the higher the average kinetic energy uh, of the uh, particles that make up your system, the higher the temperature is. But really, it's the other way around. We always talk about it as, uh, in terms of the higher the temperature is, if I tell you something is at a higher temperature than something else, that's equivalent uh, to saying this system has a higher average kinetic energy per particle than that system has. Okay. The, um, the temperature, like all such things, has, has uh, a unit. There are two uh, common units. Both of them are in the SI system. Uh, no, I shouldn't say that. that's not true. Um, it used to be that we had two two units that were used all the time, but the SI system uh, got officially got rid of one of them, but it still is used all the time. Uh, in fact, it's the most commonly used unit, even though it's not in the SI system. Uh, the most common unit for temperature is called the degree Celsius, which perhaps you'll agree is a fairly clumsy name. Essentially, without going into too much of the history of this, uh, the, 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 the topic that we're currently working on is, has a long uh, storied history uh, and is uh, the development of this topic in which, by the way, I, I don't know why I keep avoiding saying it, the, the, the topic that we're studying now is called thermodynamics, uh, which is from a Latin phrase meaning the movement or the flow of heat. Okay which is, uh, I think you'll agree now, is a very good name for, uh, for all this. Okay, so anyway, the study of thermodynamics then has a very complicated history, and it, it, is, it wasn't clean, and uh, it was, it was uh, developed as much by engineers as it was by physicists and chemists, 
And so there was a lot of competing interests and things. And a lot of people tried a lot of different things. And uh, so there's a whole bunch of really kind of fun stories, but I will spare, mo spare you most of those, uh, at least in these recordings. Perhaps we'll talk about them in class. But uh, one of them was a French physicist named Celsius. And <clears throat> he was trying to define a scale of units for temperature. And he, um, he did something fairly sensible, which was he simply said, OK, let me define my, my temperature scale in the following way. I'm going to define the temperature at which pure water freezes to be 0 degrees on my scale. Just a choice, just a definition. There's nothing uh, inevitable about it. And in fact, you'll see in the SI system of units, that's not, the, that's not where 0 is. But anyway, Celsius said, let me define the zero of my scale to be the temperature at which pure water freezes. And second, we'll define, he said, I'm going to define uh, the temperature at which water, pure water boils to be 100 degrees. Because we're just choosing it. We're just choosing our scale. And uh, then he said, and then there are 100 steps, 100 degrees of energy, 100 degrees of temperature between zero and, uh, I'm sorry, between freezing and boiling. And uh, so uh, a nice, a, a very hot summer day would be around 30, 35, 37 degrees uh, Celsius. Um, and uh, you can have temperatures, of course, below uh, zero Celsius because obviously you can get colder than uh, the freezing point of water. You can have temperatures well above the boiling point of water, obviously. But that these two choices simply set the scale. How big is a is a one degree of temperature change? Okay, so that was what Celsius did. There were other choices that were made, and you can read about them. Fahrenheit is a very is familiar in. Uh, is, is, sorry, the Fahrenheit scale is another one. It's only used in one country, as far as I know, so it's not very important. Um, the, virtually the entire world uses uh, the Celsius scale. Um, I'm joking, of course. The Fahrenheit scale, yes, it is only used in one country uh, you know, for any scientific purpose. That one country is, of course, at the time of this recording, the United States. And, uh, but everybody else uses Celsius. But the uh, United States is big and monolithic, has a lot of social inertia, hard to change. Right. Uh, OK, so uh, there is a relationship between those two scales. I'm not going to bother you with it. Suffice to say that uh, the purpose of the temperature, of the concept of temperature, is to stand, is to be a proxy and a substitute for uh, trying to worry about kinetic energy of the constituent particles. OK, so that's fantastic. The, uh, I think it's all right there down. Okay, zero degrees C is defined to be freezing temperature of water. Of pure water, not salt water or anything else like that. And then um, 100 degrees, as I say, is the boiling point, boiling temperature. Um, and in fact, yet another piece of nomenclature terminology. It is common, the, the correct phrase, you know, the, the correct way to say it is, is what I wrote here, the freezing temperature of water, the boiling temperature of water. It's real common to say this as the boiling point of water and the, and the freezing point of uh, of water. There is a reason for that terminology. I'm not going to bother you with it. OK, so that's it. So now we have uh, defined temperature. We have a concept. We know what that means. Uh, the next one, uh, next thing I want to talk about what, is what heat is. Uh, and uh, once I've defined heat, uh, then uh, we'll be in a position to actually uh, start talking about uh, how all these things interact to cause my system to change and do things that are interesting. So next lecture will be on heat. <laughs>